McKenna from Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas, and I'm laughing because we were just having some chuckles behind the scenes. Um, I am excited to be um, joining you tonight. I'm also excited that we have power and um, we're able to do this given the uh, hurricane that just came through Houston. The store is fine. We'll be open um, as usual tomorrow. We were closed today, um, but our virtual events have not been affected. Um, so we are going to be chatting this evening with Tori Eldridge, who has a brand new book out today, Ninja Betrayed, and Karen Dion, um, who has graciously agreed to be our guest interviewer. As always, if you have questions, don't forget to put those in the comments on Facebook or the live chat on YouTube. And I have a link already in the comments um, where you can find more information about both authors, their books, and um, you can order copies of their books from us. Um, we're going to get around to a fun um, giveaway in just a little bit, but if you do want to be involved in some cool prizes, um, you have to do one of two things. You have to actually you have to do both things. You have to ask questions um, and we'll choose from the best questions. And then you also, um, we would like for you to order a copy of Ninja Betrayed and then we'll get you a really cool um, present. So once I get um, Tori on here, we'll talk a little bit more about there. Um, if you are interested in seeing what other events we have coming up, they're all on our website at murderbooks.com, as well as I have um, our Facebook event listing is um, current through the end of October right now. So some really cool um, things coming up, some short story anthologies, um, Lee Child and Andrew Child for a new Jack Reacher book. Um, you know, if you're a fan of crime fiction, there's going to be someone on there that you want to see. So um, I guess that about covers it. We should definitely um, go ahead and get started with this event. So let me bring on the star of the show tonight, Tori Eldridge. Hi, Tori. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Congratulations on another wonderful book and happy pub day. Thank you. Thank you. It's so pretty. I just want to sleep with it. <laughs> <laughs> it is so pretty. I love the packaging they've done on this whole series. I mean, I it's just, just really, really terrific. Um, so kudos to your publisher on that. And I'm very excited for you. Now, before um, I bring on Karen, did you want to um, go ahead and Vanna White those prizes we were talking about? I totally want to Vanna White the prizes. Okay, great. So I went to little Osaka shopping for special Lily Wong gifts and found this beautiful incense. Uh, this is uh, the incense holder and this has incense in it. And it is um, this lovely fern. So that's beautiful. It is beautiful. Yes. And I'm drinking right now Lily and Ma's favorite calming. <laughs> Good for this excitement. Chrysanthemum Fresh tea. chrysanthemum tea. And Beautiful. I got to tell you, it's lovely. I've been drinking it all day because I've been so darn excited. And all the books that you get, if you uh, get a copy of my book from Murder by the Book, you get a signed and ninja stamped. That stamp is so cool. Book plate. And yeah. this uh, stamp is uh, my personal ninja warrior stamp and the Katsumi on Dojo uh, for our Toshin Do. So. A nifty little thing. Awesome. Um, I'm going to do your formal bio here really quickly, and then okay. we're going to bring on Karen. <clears throat> so uh, Tori Eldridge is the Anthony Lefty and McCavity Awards nominated author of the acclaimed Lily Wong series. Her short stories have been published in horror, dystopian, and other literary anthologies, and her narrative poem appears in the inaugural reboot of Weird Tales magazine. Tori's screenplay, The Gift, earned a semifinalist spot for the Academy Nickel Fellowship. Before writing, she performed as an actress, singer, dancer on Broadway, television, and film. Tori holds a fifth degree black belt in Toshindo ninjutsu and has traveled the U.S. teaching ninja martial arts and women's empowerment. And as we've already, Vanna White had held up, the new book <laughs> is The Ninja Betrayed. Yes. And it's the third in the series. And if you haven't already read this series, I don't know what's wrong with you. You need to pick them up. So um, we're also going to bring on here my favorite person of the night because it takes the work off of me. Thank you for being here, Karen. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited. We're so excited to, to see you. You know, we're big fans of your books at Murder by the Book. And I'm also uh, very excited that you've agreed to interview Tori tonight and I get to sit back and listen. So um, let me do your bio really quickly and then we'll get the show started. 
Uh, Karen Dion is the USA Today and number one internationally bestselling author of the award-winning psychological suspense novel, The Marsh King's Daughter, as well as uh, The Wicked Sister. Um, she enjoys naked, uh, naked, not naked photography. Sorry. <laughs> that might be my best blooper yet. She enjoys nature photography and lives with her husband in Detroit's northern suburbs. I'm so sorry, Karen. Obviously, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty lonely up there in the northern peninsula Nathan i don't think anybody would mind <laughs> my apologies um but now the ice is broken so you're, you're not gonna top naked photography so anyway <laughs> you guys have a wonderful you you guys have a wonderful event and i will be back on here in a little bit for the questions very nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, that takes the pressure off me. See, I don't have to be funny anymore because, you know, McKenna did. It. <laughs> so, Corey, I'm so happy to be here with you tonight and have the opportunity to interview you at your first book event for your third book. Um, you know, there's nothing like publication day. Um, we, it doesn't matter how many times we go through it. It's still super exciting. And so, you know, for me, it's just such a privilege to be here today. Oh, are you kidding? It's an honor for me. You were one of my very first friends from international thriller writers. I mean, you know, before you were this breakout huge star and before I ever had a, you know, a glimmer of Lily Wong. So, uh, yeah, it's funny that you bring that up because I was trying to think of what year we met. I know we met at the banquet at Thriller Fest. Uh, I was on the board of directors and we were, you know, randomly seated together and we just really clicked at the banquet. And it's a long time ago because we've- I'm thinking 2011? Okay. So, yeah. Something like that. Well, gosh, that's 10 years. Yikes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very happy to see you know your progress in your career. Um, it's just super. So I wanted to start reading a little bit of some of the reaction that you know best-selling authors and the trade publications have had about the ninja betrayed because I know as an author it's hard to toot your own horn. So I'm gonna I'm gonna toot your horn a little bit for you on this wonderful wonderful book. So I think probably the, the most exciting was that The Ninja Betrayed was chosen by the LA Times as five fall mysteries you shouldn't miss. So that's just like, blows your mind. It's it's so, think of all of the books that are publishing this, fall, they've chosen five mysteries and The Ninja Betrayed was one of them. How, how did you feel when you read that? Uh, you mean when I stopped running around the, the, the whole house screaming like a little kid? Uh, exhilarated. I was, I was just really, you know, the, the, uh, I think the, the subtitle line was who aren't uh, Patterson or Clinton or something like that. It was hilarious. And I was just like, oh, I was so honored. I still am. I just, yes, it, that was a dream. And you were in excellent company. And Library Journal gave the Ninja Betrayed a starred review. This is the third one I've gotten. Every book has gotten a starred review from them. Oh my oh, gosh. It's so wonderful. And yes, it, it well deserved too. So what they say is Eldridge's series just keeps getting better. While readers can enjoy this book without having read the first two, a serious highlight is Lily's evolution, the complex mm -hmm. growth of her relationships. And I completely agree. I got to read an early copy. So that's the benefit of uh, doing our event together tonight. Highly recommended for readers who enjoy strong heroines forging their own paths. And, and Mystery Seed Magazine says, electrifying, part thriller, part mystery, part travelogue, Eldridge's rich tale that fully capitalizes on both setup and setting. And I could go on and on. Lisa Gardner says, I love this. Lily Wong is my kind of kick-ass heroine. Love this series, fast paced and adrenaline packed. And Don Bentley said, part crazy rich Asians and part Game of Thrones. The Ninja Betrayed delivers in all the right ways. This book rocks. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that one just cracked me up. <laughs> and so, you know, let's, let's, that's enough of, of, of trade reaction to it. Maybe we can start by t you telling us a little bit what is this third book about? 
Oh, goodness. Well, you know, the first two books have been in Los Angeles, right? Where Lily is, you know, saving women and teens and she's being a protector of a city. And now it's family. Now it's family. Her mother has been summoned to Hong Kong for an emergency board meeting. You know, she holds a, a high position in the uh, family financial business and uh, it, it's not looking good. <laughs> And so Lily is there for, she thinks, you know, moral support and to just make sure her mom is going to do okay. And of course, it turns into way more than that, because there's something very hanky going on in this in this company and with friends and family friends who who are maybe not everything that they seem to be. And at the same time, they're landing in Hong Kong at the height of the 2019 pro-democracy uh, struggle, which means there are protests, there are riots, there are what's called raptor police, and there, there's all amount of havoc going on. And that was a really interesting thing to work on back then. I was writing this in 2020, and this book is set in 2019 in, in September because the second book is three weeks after the first, and the third book is a month after the second. And so it was very interesting to me to weave this book into an actual timeline of events and to be able to look at it kind of in hindsight to see how we got here into Hong Kong. And of course, now in 2021, the state of Hong Kong and China is much, much different. So that's going on. And then, of course, there's a wayward teen. She does seem to find them. There's this fabulous, um, oh, I love him. It's Gong Gong's driver. Gong Gong is what she calls her grandfather. And his driver, actually, um, I, I wrote it based on my son's driver in Shanghai because I just love that man. That was Mr. Fun. This is Mr. Tom. <laughs> and, and I gave Mr. Tom a, a teenage daughter who is getting sucked into this whole activism. And of course, that's a problem. And all the while, the guy that uh, Ma and Gong Gong and everybody has been setting Lily up with, Daniel Kwok, happens to be in Hong Kong for business. So uh, there's a lot of dating in this, in this book, there's a lot of romance and there's a lot of stress because it's not easy for Lily. She doesn't like, it's very difficult for her. <laughs> yeah, and, and all these different threads that you mentioned, they, they, they balance each other so well in the story. You know, the, I, I love the teenager too, you know, because uh, Lily's just looking out for her and, and, you know, looking out for everybody really. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's just awesome. And as I was reading the book, you know, there was so much detail about Hong Kong. I was mm -hmm. thinking, you you have to have spent time in Hong Kong. This is this is the kind of detail that you don't get from just, you know, Googling and Wikipedia. And then sure enough, a few days ago, you you did a guest blog post on Janet Rudolph's <sighs> Mystery And I was right. <laughs> you have been to Hong Kong. So maybe tell us a little bit about the trip and then how that influenced the book. Oh gosh, the, the trip! Oh, what a what a joy that was! Uh, my my son, he flew my husband and my younger son out to uh, Shanghai when he announced his engagement to my now daughter in law, and then her parents came in. She's from Hong Kong. They flew in from Hong Kong, and we celebrated Christmas and traveled, and then ended up in Hong Kong, and so. Um, I was privileged with an insider view because I was always with um, my daughter-in-law uh, or her parents or her brother or her aunts and uncles. I met her, her adorable grandmother. We, you know, she, she took me to all the very cool, both touristy and total local, you know, type places to be. Uh, we ate amazing food and amazing street food and, you know, all sorts of things. And what was really neat was I got, you know, kind of this local perspective on, on the place and what was going on and uh, made some really great friends. And then when, when they were married, they got married in my homeland, which was Hawaii, right, on the island of Kauai. And her family flew in through there. And her dear friend, this is my daughter-in-law's dearest friend from high school, he flew uh, in there with his fiance, and he's from Hong Kong. And he's a linguist and he teaches uh, languages in Japan. And we became, you know, very, very friendly. And so he was my beta reader 
I sent the book to him and he was like, wow, you, you really, you really know Hong Kong. And then he like, you know, gave me these like little tiny things. If, if you want to be extra local, you would say this, or you would do that, or this isn't quite spelt like that. It's spelt like this. And then when it came time for my audiobook narrator, Natalie Naudis, who is phenomenal, um, she asked me for a pronunciation guide and I went to him and bless his soul, he recorded every single Cantonese and Mandarin word in the entire book. Street sames, uh, you know, food, uh, locations, everything, because she wanted the, the authentic Hong Konger accent, dialect. Fantastic, what a cool yeah. tale. Wow, makes me want to listen to the audio version. <laughs> It just showed up on my phone, so I, I'm looking forward to it. Once I finish listening to Isabella Maldonado's, you know, uh, A Different Dawn, then then I'll get around to it. <laughs> now, now that leads to a kind of a side point because a, I know a lot of authors don't listen to their audio books. Oh. Clearly do then. Well, I do because she's wonderful. <laughs> And you know, I'm probably particular because I used to be an actress and I've done a lot of voiceovers and I love doing readings. Um, and so it's kind of my gig, you know? Mm -hmm. So I suppose I'm a bit particular, but I gotta say she's, she's phenomenal. So I enjoy it. That's fantastic. And so there's another area in which I know that you have personal experience that shows up in your books and that's martial arts. Mm -hmm. um, I pulled this picture off your website. I just the coolest picture ever. <laughs> uh, so I would like to know a little bit more about your study of martial arts. What drew you to that? And what have you accomplished? Mm. Well, you know, I uh, I had always want, been interested since I was a kid, you know, watching Kung Fu movies at uh, my friend's uh, mother's uh, Chinese theater. <laughs> but, um, you know, because I was a dancer, there's only so many things you can do physical. It starts to take, you know, really taxes the body. So I didn't get into martial arts until my eldest son got into karate when he was five. So I started in karate. And of course, I took to it like a fish to water and became utterly obsessed with this. And I was, I was very fortunate in that I was studying with, um, you know, I had a lot of teachers and they also had other interests like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Eskrima and uh, kickboxing. And so I was able to do private training and private lessons uh, on top of that, because um, which was very helpful to me because I just advanced through the ranks so fast that I got one step away from black belt in like a year and a half. But the the um, the grandmaster of that particular federation wouldn't test me for black belt until I had done three years. And so I had these other things that I could do to keep myself learning and growing. And it's right about then that I discovered Toshin Do Ninjutsu. And so I started training with that also on the side. <laughs> and so I was training in both of those. And once I, I learned the, I started learning the ninja arts. I mean, that was it for me. I just knew because it is the most comprehensive art I've ever come across. It is armed, it is unarmed, it's on the ground, it's in the air. Sometimes I've, I've fought in the air, uh, all sorts of weapons, both archaic and modern. And, and so it was just so exhilarating. And then it also has a whole esoteric practice that um, touches in with Tendai Buddhism and meditation. And I've been meditating since I was 12. So it just, it gelled with me on so many levels. And it's a Japanese art and my North Dakota Norwegian father, my Hawaiian Chinese mother met and married in Japan, and my sisters were born there. There were too many things, right? They were all just like coming together. So, you know, when I was writing this series and all of these books, it's so Im important to me to show, you know, this authentic look at at the ninja arts. And so I, I, I really enjoy showing, you know, kind of a, a take on what a modern day ninja is like. Well, I think it's fantastic, you know, the way you give people like myself and I'm sure many others who have no idea about the field of study at all. <laughs> you know, it, it's like you've, you've drawn back the curtain and you've opened the window and, and we feel like, you know, in, in 
reading your books, we can learn a little bit about what that's like. So, yeah. Now, you mentioned at the outset that, you know, your books, in addition to signature, they, they're stamped with your warrior name. Oh, yeah. What's your warrior? What is that about? Okay, my warrior name is Miyotoshi. And um, you, can, you can say Miyotoshi and have different kanji spellings. And so depending on the spelling, it changes the meaning. So the meaning of my warrior name is warrior of the unfathomable blade. So they call it my my Toshi. That's the warrior part. My Toshi warrior name is Mio Toshi. So yeah, that's awesome. I know it was given to me. Um, my my teacher said because of the depth with which I seek, and the depth of my understanding. So I thought that was really neat. Nice, nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, another area in your books that is, I'm always struck by is the cultural diversity. Now you mm. talk about that in your own. Lily's family is very similar to your. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Why did you make that choice? Um, well, I mean, yeah, it's not like I, I wanted to think what is the weirdest combination I could make a person and came up with Chinese Norwegian. Um, I, it was my culture and it's a way of a part of my culture, most of my culture. And it was a way of celebrating that. And it gave me an excuse to dive even deeper. Mm. So, um, you know, Lily is not me. Her parents are not my parents. We have things in common the way many of my Asian Pacific friends and I have things in common. Uh, Lily is also first generation. I'm, I'm not first generation. My grandfather came in from Canton. Um, so I, you know, I have some things removed. And of course, I grew up in Hawaii, which is very different than growing up Asian in uh, mixed Asian in Los Angeles, which is where Lily grew up. So it was, um, I really enjoy diving deep into that and finding out, you know, what what this cultural mix is to Lily and how that is with her family and her family dynamic. Uh, she's not one of these people who's pulled, you know, I don't fit here, I don't fit there, which way am I? She she is truly embrace both of her cultures equally and of equal importance and they and her parents um, go out of their way to um, to infuse that in her, but it's, it's so, it's so uh, intrinsic to who she is and how things work. So, you know, this is, this book is equal parts ninja action thriller and intriguing mystery and cultural family dynamic. And, you know, the, the goal was how to balance that so that it's all equal and that the pacing never slows. Yeah, and you, you do such a beautiful job with that. Uh, you really do, Tori. Um, I was really struck as I was reading The Ninja Betrayed with how much um, Lily loves her family and her family loves her. And I was thinking to myself, that's that's kind of breaking the mold a little bit. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you could say that Lily is like a vigilante, you know? And and so usually these people are loners. Um, they're just acting on their own, you know, the classic Jack Reacher, right? Mm -hmm. you no know Jack Reacher. She's got, you know, this warm, loving relationship with her family. And I love seeing, you know, as Library Journal said, how it evolves over the course of your three books. And you see, you know, a little, you get a little bit more of, of what who she is as a person. It's It's really delightful. Oh, I'm glad. And with every book, you you learn a little bit more about somebody else. Right. That's right. Yeah. So that's that's fun. So let's go back to the beginning. How did you get the idea for the series? What what made you decide to start writing this? Oh, uh, total chance. Um, I, actually, I was working on a novel. I was working on a sequel to a novel that I was shopping. <laughs> And um, through Facebook, there was a challenge that came in. Can you write a thriller in 200 words? And so I stopped writing and I went, oh, let's see if I can. So I wrote a thriller in 200 words and I entered the contest. I didn't win. But I went, you know, that's a really good premise. So um, then I went back to writing. And then one day I got this, I think it was... Um, Writer's Digest or something, you know, had a contest for a short story. And um, the due date was the next night. <laughs> and I was like, you know, Jonathan Mayberry is always telling me that I should write short stories while I'm doing this. And so I thought, 
I'm going to take his advice. I like taking, you know, people's advice when they know what they're talking about. So I sat down stream of consciousness and I took that premise of that 200 word thing. And I just started writing. Uh, if anybody's read the Ninja daughter, um, the scene in the bar, you know, the really intense one, you know, the one I'm talking about that came out in this short story and it just came out. And that's when I discovered Lily. Uh, I didn't know who she was until she appeared as I was writing. Wow, that is so cool. And I think, you know, um, that some people call it serendipity, but I think it's more inspiration, you know, it's, and clearly we've already talked about how there's a lot of you in Lily. So, you know, this, this character really came from you. We can see that so easily. So did, I, I assume, you know, when you started writing the first book, you had it in this series. Did, are you a plotter? Like, did you sit down <laughs> going to go over the course of the series? Oh, no. <laughs> the course of the series? No. The book? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm a total plotter. Uh, I, I'm crazy. I, you know, I started in screenwriting, so I do this kind of four act outline and, uh, you know, and then I, yeah. Uh, so I, I get an inspiration. It, it gets bigger from there. Once I have everything kind of filled in in my head, all the subplots and the stuff that goes into that big middle, then I divide everything into these four uh, four acts to make sure that the pacing is okay and that I don't have this, you know, big, huge beginning and this really tiny middle. <laughs> So I make sure all that's going on. I like chapter by chapter summaries so that when I start writing, I don't look at an empty page. And uh, they just give me notes, you know, like uh, what's the purpose of the scene, what's going on. And then when I start to write, you know, sometimes I stick with that uh, outline. Mostly I do, but sometimes there are chapters that disappear and other chapters that, you know, have to be there. And, and then Lily just does whatever Lily's going to do and surprises me all the time. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's a funny kind of thing that you say that because, um, uh, again, you know, everything that you say, I can see it in your work. And I've always been a little bit jealous of authors, novelists who have a screenwriting background because you really understand pace and, and structure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the rest of us had to kind of learn it the hard way. So, well, you know, hold on a second, Missy, because you are like one of the masters of suspense and pacing, which is, of course, why they are making a movie out of The Marsh King's Daughter. And they just finished shooting, right? They just finished, they wrapped the shooting. And yes, they filmed it, the whole thing in Canada. Um, <gasps> daughter the story takes place in michigan's upper peninsula in the wilderness and so you know i was i was not able to go because of covid canada had oh. restrictions and so um you know i had always dreamed of visiting the set so i had to to scour the internet for any little tidbits i can find and um i did find that one of the they they filmed the climax of the book it's on the french river in ontario in the wilderness it was a 20 minute boat ride to get there. So oh my. through equipment, everything, um, the Dokas First Nations tribe provided transportation. Oh. And the director of photography, uh, he posted a little clip to Instagram stories showing them lowering equipment by helicopter. <laughs> How did I miss that? I have been eating up all the little tidbits that you've been showing. How did I miss that story? Yeah. That was so awesome. So awesome. So, you know, they really, they really spared no expense, literally, because I know what helicopters rent for. I'll say. <laughs> Make sure that the movie was authentic. So yeah, it's super exciting. You're, you're very kind to. Uh, well, no, I'm, I'm going to be the first one in the seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so let's go back to, to Lily and your books and your series. Um, I'm interested always in an author's publishing journey. Was it easy for you to find a publisher or did that go for you? Just version. Well, I, it took seven and a half years to oh. land a, a publishing deal. And in all that time, uh, I just I just kept writing. I just kept writing. And um, I was working on, I had um, a novel in progress that it was such an epic novel. It's actually going to be published in May, Dance Among the Flames. But back then, it, I was I was uh, still working on it. There were so many ways to tell the story, and it was the project on which I learned my craft. And 
And so I was writing that novel and then I was uh, looking into this other this other book that was set in Bali and I was working on that. Uh, and then that's when I, I did the short stories and I, I took Jonathan's advice and I started writing short stories in between. So I actually was published first with short stories and anthologies. So I had a short story in Suspense Magazine and then um, Never Fear the Tarot and Never Fear the Apocalypse um, Horror horror and thriller. I'm a member of HWA and ITW. So, and you know, horror and thrillers, they, they go hand in hand. I didn't know I was going to write anything called crime fiction until I landed the deal with, um, you know, Polis Books. And they said, you're going to be one of the three launch authors for Agora Books, which is a diversity focused crime fiction imprint. And that's when I went, oh, I guess I've written crime fiction. <laughs> I guess I better look into that. <laughs> but yeah, that took that took seven and a half years. So by the time by the time that came around, I had two books in submission, Lily and and this other one. I had I had uh, the books that came after them completely outlined, chapter by chapter, summary, partially written, and I had a fifth book completely outlined and half written. And then that's when I got the deal. So I had to put all those things aside and just dive right in onto the Ninja Daughter and the Ninja's Blade. Fortunately for me, I'm not a fast writer, but fortunately for me, I had given myself a head start yeah. because I had that big outline and, and chapters written and I had done so much research for the, for the Ninja's Blade that I was able to slip back into it pretty quick. That's a very, very interesting experience. And um, I, I really like the part about you writing short stories because I think oh. excellent training for a novel. Jonathan was right, you know, in advising you to write short stories because it really trains you, you know, a, sh a short story, you can't be lazy. Every word counts, you know, and, uh, you know, a novel, you can get a little sloppy here and there, although I tend to obsess and want every word to be perfect. Oh my gosh, so do I. And I'm really big on economy. You know, I, I like, you know, lush economic prose. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's kind of my thing. But you know, something else is really great about writing short stories, if you're a novelist, is that, um, you know, you can you can get them out, you know, a little here and a little there. And if you get them published, it gives you a talking point, it gives you a way of entering a community, building readership, um, you know, uh, being part of the writing community. It gives you something to put on your website, something to talk about, something to promote. So it, it kind of gets you into all of that. And um, quite frequently, one published short story leads to another. Um, I've had, you know, quite a few uh, invitations. I had, you know, uh, Surviving Tomorrow and Running Wild Anthology of Stories. And, but I had to turn down quite a few. And then I've got a new mystery um, short story coming out in um, the uh, Mystery Writers um, Association, Mystery Writers of America, the new Coming Home anthology. I'm looking forward to that, but you know, it's hard. Short stories are hard for me. So I've had to turn down some invitations because it just, it can really pull me away. I'm glad you said that because I have a short story in the uh, BoucherCon anthology and it took me a month to write. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that's a month that I wasn't working on my novel, you know? So uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I'll say. <laughs> Okay. Um, do you have any other advice for aspiring authors who might be listening into our discussion tonight? Oh, gosh. You know, I think uh, one, one of the best things is if you can focus on, if you can enjoy the process, you know, when um, it, it, like I said, it took seven and a half years, but I really enjoyed that. Um, and and for the most part, I was very patient and very just kind of into the the art of writing and the things that you were learning and stuff like that. So if you can really enjoy that and try not to worry so much about the end result, because that can make you crazy, you know, just worry about the writing and 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 submit, you know, and once it's submitted, don't wait around for an answer. Write something immediately. <laughs> And, and put your mind on, on the work, the work. And the other thing is building community. 
we have such an amazing, writers are amazing. And there are so many associations and organizations and things. So I would say just join as many as, as you can. Join the ones that uh, some you have to qualify for, others you don't. Some cost money, some don't. You know, find the ones that, that work for you and find your tribe. Yeah, that's so, so true. And, you know, like we mentioned, we've been writer friends for maybe 10 years. Yes. Yeah. And so we've kind of grown in the business together at the same time. And so, you know, that shared experience, it's something that you don't get even with your mate, you know, or, or your spouse or your partner, you know, so oh, only another writer understands why we're so crazy. So, and it's such a thrill to watch somebody who you knew when, and you just watch them skyrocketing. I mean, I have just taken such incredible delight in watching your skyrocketing success, you know, you and Lynn, Lynn, uh, Constantine and I, you know, just some uh, friends. It's just been astounding to just sit back and go, "Wow, this is this is incredible." And my takeaway from that, because the Marsh King's Daughter was my breakout book, but it was my fourth published novel. Yeah, twenty years of being published, and so um, you can break out. The so, so basically, every author out there. Just if they haven't broken out yet, keep the faith because, you know, I, like you say, Liv Constantine, Riley Sager, there's bunches of them, you know, Wendy Walker, they all did that, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And now, now we got uh, Sean Cosby, S.A. Cosby, you know, uh, Black Top Wasteland, but it wasn't his debut, you know, but bam, you know, what a book. Right. Uh, so it's, it's exhilarating to watch, you know, it's it, great fun. And, and, you know, in some ways you've touched on an answer to one of my other questions, which authors inspired you, <laughs> but, but more from a, what do you like to read? You know, which, uh, I know that's a hard question when you have 3 million friends. Well, you know what, what's crazy is before, uh, what I read now is a little bit different than what I used to read before I was a writer, because what I read now uh, so many of them, I, I want to read what my friends are, are are writing, and you know the people in my community. And but before, I mean, I used to chain read series books, and sometimes I would read an entire series. I read The Wheel of Time twice, you know, <laughs> the entire series. I mean, I would do crazy stuff like that. I read Shogun three times, um, you know. So I mean, I loved you know Barbara Kingsolver, and I loved you know uh, Pillars of the Earth, and I loved. Um, you know, just uh, all, all sorts of things. Pearl S. Buck's The Good Earth was my my favorite childhood book, if you can wrap your brain around that one. You know, and then I was like into, you know, Stephen King and, you know, The Omen and oh my gosh, I, so many things. But these these days, um, I'm reading a lot of uh, authors of color. I'm reading a lot because uh, I really, really love that element, right? Of, uh, you know, I, I love a good mystery, right? A good mystery. I love a good thriller and I love all that stuff, but I like that and to get a window into another community or even a deeper window into my community or perhaps a, a, a glimpse into my, you know, something of me in the past right? Or I just really enjoy books that that have uh, several things going on, which I, I guess is why I wrote Lily Wong, right? You know, I wanted the action thriller. I wanted the mystery. I wanted the, the deep cultural stuff that uh, and family dynamic that you usually only get in, in what a, a historical novel or a literary fiction, you know? So, but I, I like books that that combine all those sorts of things. So I guess that's that's kind of what I was reading. And of course, you know, I read The Wicked Sister. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And then I had to read that thing so dang fast <laughs> because not, and I read it a long time ago. It's not because I was under a time limit, it's because the tension was so incredibly uncomfortable. I had to get to the end. <laughs> it was insane. I, I, I do say this. So the March King's daughter, um, Helena's father is a narcissist. And in the Wicked Sister, we're dealing with a psychopath. So in the book I'm working on now, there's no mental disorders. They're just. Oh. <laughs> so. But there's family, right? There's a family dynamic, I bet you. 
See, you and I, we both are really into this kind of complex family dynamic thing that's underlying all this sort of weird stuff. Uh, there's a lot of that in the Ninja Betrayed. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's 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 fun. But I, I enjoy books that do that. So, so one last question for me, and I'm, I'm assuming there's some questions in the chat. I have, uh, I'm using my phone because my computer acted up on me, so I'm not able to see the chat, but I'm gonna assume there are questions there. So I just wanna ask one last question. What's next for Lily? Oh, uh, well, I, I've just, I'm in the research stage of writing the fourth book. And um, I do a lot of research. I'm, I'm a really big into research. And um, just because I, especially Lily Wong books are, are woven into actual, you know, I like that fact and fiction. And so I'm in the research stage and it's really pretty crazy because it involves somebody else's family. And I have to have an understanding of several generations of them and everything that happened in that area. I'm being very cagey here. Very everything that happened in, in that place, that area, so that I can get a sense of who the characters are that are alive now that matter and what their relationships are with Lily and these other people um, that are going on in there. And for me, that's where characters come from. The, the Ninja's Blade was like that. I knew I wanted Lily to dive into the commercial sex trafficking of women in Los Angeles. And so I did a deep dive into research and from that came all those beautiful characters. The same thing is happening now. So. Once I get all those characters and you know my ideas for all the the plots, I can tell you this next one. That one is going to be a huge action, international action thing. So I'm I'm really I'm psyched about that, and uh, you know, and then uh, just you know having fun with this and and getting ready for the cover reveal for Dance Among the Flames. It's it's been it's been quite a ride. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, well deserved. We couldn't be happier for you. Um, you know, yay for the for the third book out. It's fantastic. Everybody who's listening in, you must buy it. Of course, you've already bought it, right? It's like you all had it on pre order and you've got it in your hands right now. <laughs> Look at the back. Isn't it beautiful? I love it. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> It is beautiful. And Karen, thank you for a wonderful interview. You guys did a great job. Uh, it was a terrific chat. We have a million comments and some oh. questions. So I'm going to do the questions, but um, the way this program works, I have to scroll through them all. So it may take a second for me to find the questions within the comments, but it's always more fun to have a chatty crowd, which we have tonight. So Oh, I'm so glad. Great. You'll have to go back and look later. Um, okay. So I just want to remind everyone about the giveaway that um, that is happening if you want to order the books. Um, what we'll probably do is I'll get in touch with um, Tori. Yes, chrysanthemum tea and the beautiful incense burner holder. Yeah, that's lovely. Um, so what I'll probably do is uh, wait for orders to come in over the next 24 hours or so and then maybe reach out to Tori based on who asked questions, who ordered books, and then we'll get all that sorted out. So I won't announce winners tonight until we see since there is a purchase component. I failed to mention earlier, it's open to US residents only. I did put that in the comments. So just a reminder, US residents only, um, please. Okay, first question from Shannon. Was this book easier to write than the previous two? Um, uh, hmm. <laughs> That's, that's a really great question. Was it? Um, no. <laughs> uh, you know, I think the the second the second book scared the bejesus out of me. So that was that was hard in and of itself. When I think back on the third book, come to think of it, the premise came, the whole premise, the you know, all the subplots and everything came together in two hikes very long hikes yeah. in the hills, I think best on my feet. So I knew I went out for a hike knowing that Lily and Ma were going to Hong Kong on family business. That's all I knew. I came back from the hike with a whole lot of information, put that all down, went the next day on to another hike and filled in all the blanks, came back, wrote that all down. And then it was, you know, trying to fit that all together. So I would say after about a week and a half, 
I was starting to actually write words on a wow. page, which for me is really fast. Have you um, found the same process, Karen, with your writing? Is it, is it, how has it changed since the first book? Well, I, I really with the second book too. And you know, the, the follow-up to the Marsh King's daughter is the wicked sister. It was, it was the hardest, the Marsh King's daughter was the easiest book I'd ever written. And then the wicked sister was the hardest I've ever written. So, and I, and I'm equally proud of both. Isn't that true, Tori? You know, Oh yeah. The struggle that you might have on, it doesn't show in the final version. It's just, you know, us behind the scenes pulling our hair out. But uh, yeah. Much yeah, each one is different. This fourth one, I can tell I'm going to be in, in research for quite a while. With the second book, I was in research for quite a while before everything came together. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see here. So we have another question. This is going to be for both of you again. If you were stranded on a mountain, what book would you have to have with you? A survival book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to edit this. To say In what fact, I even know by who, by oh, okay. Hakeem okay. Eastler, who is a ninja friend of mine. Look him up. <laughs> wow. All right. Uh -huh. How about you, Karen? Well, I'm trying to think of the really big fat books I've read. <laughs> exactly. Because I want it to last. So, yeah, I would, I would, I would want the, the fattest, thickest book. I, I suppose Ken Follett's Pillar of the Earth and World Without... <gasps> You know, if I could carry them. <laughs> if we, you know, if, if he did like a, a three book volume, right? you know, and, and then it would weigh like 50 pounds, then that would be pretty good. I read both of those back to back and they're both over a thousand pages. So they're both. fabulous. I, I love them both. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, some commentary on the covers and I'm going to choose this comment because they color coded their hearts to match them. I feel like that, I love that's that. Extra Hi, effort. Shannon. So good job, <laughs> Shannon. Um, so let's talk about, do you have a say in the covers? How does that process oh, work? I am so fortunate. Yes, I have a say in the covers. They, um, for, even from the beginning, you know, we, we went through a couple of ideas and then the, you know, um, I, I gave out colors and I gave out ideas for, you know, uh, weapons and things. And the designer came up with this, uh, for the ninja daughter that's the first one right and then i kind of tweaked it i'm like okay i need more than than just weapons i need something that shows the japanese and chinese and they were like on it we can do that and then with the second book um the ninja's blade i mean the first question Chantel asked me was what are the icons you want what you know what do you want to say about this one and then with this book you know, it was the same thing. What do you want to say on this? And the color, this color is jade. Um, you'll notice it is literally my jade. Um, and I got this jade in Hong Kong. My daughter-in-law picked it out for me. And jade is really important to Lily's mother. It's all her jewelry in there. And so, you know, um, there are all sorts of these little icons. And if you want to know what this is about, all of this, go to Mystery Fanfare. Okay, you know, that's uh, Janet Rudolph's blog, right? And search my name and you'll come up with a, a couple of essays I've done for her. We did, um, I did a, a cover reveal article that talks about all the symbolism in the color and the icons of this book. Excellent, excellent. Um, okay, so I think that we'll have some input, input from Karen on this next question. Which do you prefer, writing a series or writing a standalone? And is one easier than the other? Well, I've only written standalones. So um, I, in some ways, I'm jealous of people who are writing a series because, you know, with a standalone, you have to start over from the very beginning, you know, creating the book, creating the characters. You're not revisiting them. But I do say, uh, as a person and as a writer, I'm very easily bored. So... <laughs> I need to start fresh each time. So I can't compare the two, but that's why standalones work for me. I've written both. Um, I, I just recently finished a standalone dystopian thriller that I'm going to have to set aside for a while because it strikes way too close to everything that we've been going through. It's set in an antimicrobial resistant future and involves a political conspiracy. And now I came up with this idea and I started this book 
um, is from a short story that was in something like, you know, 2017. And I started the book in 2018. Half of the book was finished of that thriller before I got the Lily Wong deal. And I wasn't able to finish it until the second, uh, until the pandemic started. And that was weird. So, um, so, you know, so I did that. And then uh, Dance Among the Flames is, is a standalone, but uh, it has potential that I've explored. And so, you know, we'll see there. And then, of course, Lily, Lily was always going to be a series. I, I knew it from when I wrote the short story. I knew she was going to be a series. So how does it compare? You know, as Karen says, it's, it's a whole lot of work starting from the beginning because you've got a whole world building. With uh, the second and third book, it's it's a lot easier uh, in a sense and a lot quicker in, in a sense because I know my main character. I know the families. I know them deeply. I know, you know, I know the nature of the book. I know the voice of the book. Every book I write has a different voice. The voice goes with the book. You know, I'm sure that, you know, parts of me come through my style of writing, but but really the, the books sound different because the voice is different. Um, Dance Among the Flames is, is written in multiple close third persons, you know, and, and it's very lush. And Lily is single person and she's like, she's like this. So, um, so I, I find it really fun. That said, um, I liked being able to take a break you know, from having written the second and worked on that dystopian, then started the third and, you know, and kind of doing that. I, I like doing both, you know, like Karen, I get bored easy and I, I like to kind of mix it up so I can kind of change that vibe and, and stretch a little as a writer. And then again, short stories really help with that too. Yeah. Um, we have a question, Karen, I'm sorry if I pop this on the screen and it covers you for a second, I'll take it off. It's a longer question. Sometimes that happens. Oh, no, your head's still there. Okay. Oh. Writing question, Tori. <laughs> <coming out> to. <clears throat> How do you balance backstory and forward momentum in the later books in the series? Is it hard to keep both your regular readers and readers new to your work engaged and entertained? That's a great question. That, that is a fantastic question. Yeah, with me, everything is about pacing and uh, my outlining really uh, the whole four act outlining really helps me with that pacing because um, each act uh, has a beginning, a middle, uh, and an end. It has a, a turning point and a climax. And so I'm always racing to those things and moving it around. And I color code things so that I'm never staying too long with any one character, any one subplot, any one, you know, action, things like that. Now, when it comes to uh, the writing of the series, um, there are certain things that, that you need to know but um, you don't need to know everything, you know? So like you can drop in to Lily's world with the, with the third book and you will be fine. You will fit right into Lily's family. You will get a sense of who everybody is. You will get a feel for, for their relationship. You will get an idea, an idea of what happened before. And if it has anything to do with um, like the intrigue or mystery of what happened, uh, before, then what you'll get are teasers, you know, so my goal is to make you go, you know what, I got to go back and pick up the Ninja Daughter because what was that about? Yeah. You know, so you you may have like teeny little spoiler alerts, you know, like, you know, this person survived or, you know, that person, whatever, but it, you're, it's, I try and write it in a way that it comes out more as a teaser to entice you to go back and read it. Sure. So, Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay, we're going to do a couple other quick questions and I think we'll be done. So um, movie rights sold yet for Ninja's Daughter or others? Oh, Andrew, you would ask. <laughs> I, you know, we are trying. Uh, my, my husband's a television film producer and he is out there with a whole lot of really exciting projects. And so the nice thing is, is that when he runs into people who might be interested in anything that's close to Lily Wong, uh, she's in the room and uh, there's a conversation. But at this point, there, there is no nibbling yet uh so we'll just have to we'll just have to see it's it's kind of a it's kind of an interesting timing for it especially with that kung fu remake and yeah. but uh yeah i was kind of like okay so hmm, we'll see <laughs> so well, i don't know andrew <laughs> fingers fingers crossed 
as a producer, it doesn't help you one little bit. Well, I was going to say he's not producing your work, but uh, he is opening little doors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's not uh, that kind of producer. He Like when he did the Equalizer movies, um, he was the first producer because he's the one who said, this should be made into a movie. Let's let's make sure you have the rights. Let's go. Let's shop it. He was the one who took it all around town, and you know, at one point had you know Russell Crowe in it, and at one point had you know all sorts of things before Denzel came in. Uh, but he's not the kind of producer who who does the production or who you know works for the studio. He's the kind of producer who has the project and puts the elements together. So there there are many different kinds of producers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure that, that there will be a nibble soon because they're so cin cinematic, they should work great. Um, all right, and the last question I have is, Have has Tori considered collecting her stories into a book? Oh, hi, Tina. Um, you know, no, I I'm gonna pull up Jonathan Mayberry again because he's gave me a lot of really great mm -hmm. advice. I remember early on, I asked him, uh, is it is it better to do a collection or an anthology? And he said, you know, unless until you have a body of work in short stories where you have such a name for yourself, right? That uh, people want a Neil Gaiman collection, right? You know, people, uh, that that kind of a thing. He said, it's, it's much better to be in an anthology where you're increasing discoverability yeah. and uh, you're with other authors. So no, I don't have, you know, any any plans in the, in the near, or even Midland future of thinking about a, a collection. All right, um, so that's all the questions. It timed out pretty perfectly. I wanna thank Karen for coming in and interviewing and um, doing such a wonderful job being so prepared. Um, not everyone does this wonderful of a job. So thank you so much, Karen. Tori, congratulations on the third in the series. Happy Pub Day, wonderful, uh, wonderful talk tonight and all the information is in the comments. If you guys want to order books, we will post the uh, prize winners um, in about 24 hours or so. And I'll get in touch with Tori and we'll get those prizes sent out. Um, thanks to everyone for watching. And I'm going to go ahead and sign us off and say good night. Thanks again, I, ladies. I just want to jump in and thank you, McKenna, and thank Murder by the Book for hosting tonight. You know? <laughs> What you guys do to connect readers and writers is so fantastic. So thanks so much. And wow. you're so you're so special to me because you were the bookseller at Bautricon when I debuted the Ninja Daughter. I remember. And, and it sold out like halfway through the first day. And I was just like, oh my gosh. And well, ever since then. Credit, that's a credit to you and your personality and being such a delight because that we never know how many to order for debut authors. And um, we were like, had we known her ahead of time, we would have had stacks and stacks and stacks because your personality definitely shines. So um, anyway, thank you both. And it's a pleasure to have done this tonight. And um, I hope to see you both in person at some point in the future, hopefully when, when the world gets its act back together. So um, I am going to say good evening and thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>